Today on the Kathy Brock Report, we discuss electoral systems. We revisit the 2008 election, talk to a kindergarten class, and discover what is up with the American Electoral College. And now, here are your hosts. Ben. And Will. And you're watching the Kathy Brock Report. Let's start off this episode by visiting Dan as he talks to a kindergarten class. Good morning, kids. Hi! Well, today, kids, I'm going to be explaining to you the electoral systems. So, Canada is well known for its single member plurality system, um, also known as first past the post. Now, the important thing for you guys to remember here is that. All of Canada is broken up into 308 ridings or constituencies. The way that they're divided up isn't by equal size. The way it's done is actually by population. So we could have a really big riding or constituency up here in Nunavut where lots of people are dispersed over a large area or a little tiny one here in Ontario where the population's condensed. So what you need to remember here is that every riding is supposed to have essentially the same number of seats. On election day, every Canadian citizen over the age of 18 votes for one representative that is running for election in their particular district, so one of the 308. The important thing to remember about these, the first past the post electoral system is that it's a winner-take-all system. So in each one of those 308 contested ridings, only one person is going to win from each one. Let's take the example of Kingston right here where we have a Liberal representative, a Conservative, NDP, Green, and Communist representative running. Even though the Conservative only has 33% of the vote, not enough to make a majority, simply a plurality, they take, they, they're, they're the ones who get to represent their constituency in the House, and they win everything. So something really unique happens in this system when you look at the popular vote versus the seat allocation in the House after the election. So a theoretical explanation could be that um, the overall popular vote of all the 308 seats could turn out to be the Liberals getting 53% of that popular vote. Despite that, if they, if they somehow manage to win every single one of those individual con contests, they could still end up with 100% of the seats in the House, so all 308, and can control the House absolutely. So what does the system mean? It means that since it's a winner-take-all, the political parties involved want to win as many ridings as possible. How do they do this? By capturing the most votes. So what they do is, if you look at the political spectrum here of being left-wing or right-wing, traditionally you can capture the most votes by appealing to the center where most people reside. Okay, so let's go over some of the key characteristics of the first-past-the-post system. A, you have low voter turnout. People don't think that their vote really counts as much. B, you have majority governments. Uh, you tend to have a lot more in this system than any other because of the small number of parties, um, which goes to the third part, there are a small number of parties out there. Uh, there's also a lot of centralized platforms, as we uh, discussed earlier, trying to capture as many votes as possible. You centralize your platform to appeal to as many people as possible, and fewer elections. Uh, since you are having more majority governments or strong governments, it's, there's a less likelihood that parliament will be dissolved. So the pros of the first-past-the-post system? Stability in government and ability to govern. The cons, it's not exactly representative and there's a lot of political apathy. All right kids, let me introduce you now to proportional representation, um, a system that contrasts well with first past the post. This electoral system begins with each party submitting ranked lists publicly of the politicians that they would like to see in the legislature. On election day, the percentage of votes a party receives is translated directly into the number of seats they receive, with one catch. A threshold is set, usually at about 1 or 2 percent, that keeps radical fringe parties out. That could accumulate maybe 0.1 percent of the vote with a very radicalized idea. Given the number of parties, majorities are very, very rare. So the way the government is formed is by coalitions coming into place. A coalition is a number of parties coming together to form 50 percent plus one of, um, of the number of seats in the House. The way they do this is through bargaining and negotiations. Typically, after the election, the negotiations taking place between the parties to form government are just as exciting as the election itself. 
So let's go over some of the generalized characteristics of a proportional representation system. Usually, we're talking about a lot of parties. The, those parties have very specific platforms that aren't centralized. There's high voter turnout because people feel like their vote actually means something. And elections are pretty frequent. Let's take a look at some of the pros of the PR system. So there's greater party cooperation. Since the governments are usually formed through coalitions, the parties need to learn to work well together. And obviously, it's more representative of the electorate. Some of the cons, you have a volatile government, uh, since there are a lot of elections happening. And fringe parties can hold on too much power. So you can have tiny parties, which have a small amount of um, electorate support, who have key ministries and wield un unproportional amounts of power. All right, kids. Well, thanks for having me. That's electoral systems in a nutshell. It's been great. Bye. Okay, can you guys shake your bar?